Hello Year 11. This is a little um, revision PowerPoint video voiceover thing I've put together to help with um, revision for the mock examinations. Um, I've used a, a format called Pixel um, and you'll see some of the little strategies so there's some little tasks to do. You will need some paper at some point in the lesson today. You're um, more than welcome to make notes as we're going through the revision uh, PowerPoint, um, but I will be expecting you to do some of the tasks, okay, to help with revision. So first of all, this is an overview of your entire um, GCSE course for Year 11. Currently, we have studied the B2.1, this one, the B2.2, this one, and we're around about halfway through the B2.3. And basically, you will be, for your mock exams, revising up to that section there, okay? So these ones we have yet to study, um, variation and evolution, response and regulation, and disease defense and treatment, okay? So this PowerPoint runs through the revision of all of these subjects, but for today, I'm just going to record going up to where you need to for the mock exam to genetic profiling. And then I will set you some little tasks to do. So I will ask um, the teacher to pause the video so that you can have a go at doing some of the revision tasks. So just like a variety of different styles and different um, types of revision activity. So in the unit B2.1 classification and biodiversity, you pretty much taught yourself this from um, June onwards. All of the videos, remember, are still online on Moodle. Right? They will be there, okay, for you to access throughout your time um, left in school. Okay, so every single lesson is there. All of the quizzes are there. You can still reattempt those quizzes as revision. You can have a look at um, how you performed on the polar bear assignment, um, the QWC question, so you can see um, what the mark scheme was, what it's like. So in this topic, we covered classification, why um, in science we have scientific names, and normally the genus and species name is written the genus is the first part with a capital letter and the species name is the second part and is always with a lowercase letter. So there's some certain rules that um, you need to be aware of. Common question that they tend to ask in the GCSE exam is they might give you the genus and species name and they might have made an obvious mistake and put the genus with a lowercase letter and they want you to identify what's wrong with it. Um, we then go on to morphological. Morphological are the physical adaptations that um, both animals and plants have. So the cacti, the polar bear, the camel that we've studied. And then you've also got behavioural adaptations. So they can come up in the exam paper in a variety of different formats. Then we've got um, resources that organisms need to survive. Populations and competition. Biodiversity. Quadrats the factors that affect the distribution of organisms, principles of sampling. This one here, wherever you see dark black bold, is always going to be um, higher tier. So the principles of capture, recapture, and estimating population size, okay, um, is there, and use of biological control agents and alien species. So we'll go through all of these, okay, um, in the PowerPoint. So first of all, starting off with classification. You need to know the order in which we divide um, the classification system up in. So we always start with this is the largest group of organisms, the kingdom, followed by the phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. Now I had quite a lot of emails back in June, July time with people saying, um, are we expected to know um, the full classification for all of these different animals that you've studied in your book? No. But the things you are expected to know is that when we come to things like the phylum, there will be the vertebrates which have a backbone and the invertebrates that do not have a backbone. So if they give you a picture, for example, of a fox and they say, what's the kingdom? The kingdom is obviously the animal kingdom, but it will be a vertebrate. 
Then they might give you some of this other stuff in between. They might tell you the name of the fox, the genus and species within the body of the question. And they're expecting you to identify that. And don't forget, you have to have your capital letter at the start for um, uh, the genus. So I think the fox is Alapex, Alapex lagopus, okay? And obviously for the species, it would be a lowercase um, letter. So you've got to remember the order of these. And to help you remember this order, we made mnemonics up, or I suggested you make a mnemonic up. A mnemonic is a phrase that helps you to remember the order, the sequence of things, okay? So an obvious one would be my very easy method just speeds up naming planets, is the way that um, you can remember the order of the planets uh, starting from the sun outwards. So with my is Mars, very is Venus, easy is Earth, and so on, okay? So here we've got a mnemonic to help us remember this order. Kids prefer candy over fried green spinach. The kids is K for kingdom. Prefer is um, P for phylum. Candy is C for class. Over, O for order. F, fried for family. Uh, G, green. G for genus. And S for spinach species, okay? Um, so you'll notice I've put capital letters and then when I've got to species, I've put it as a lower case. So as we can see on this slide, um, if you've got a kingdom or phylum, there's a greater number of species within that group, but there are huge differences between them. As you come down this classification division system, when you get to species, there are a, a fewer number of species that have similar kind of like features about them. And don't forget all the PowerPoints as well, as well as the booklets with the answers in are all on Moodle. OK, so you can check your work in your booklet. So if we look at the animal kingdom, I've already said that we've got um, the vertebrates and the invertebrates. So I'm going to start with the vertebrates first because um, they're divided into five groups. And you should know these from key stage three because we have studied them back in the unit on your world back in year seven. So we've got the group of mammals. We belong to the mammals. Um, these organisms, they all have backbones, obviously, but mammals have hair or fur. They feed their young on milk. They're warm blooded. So we've got some examples, things like a cow, a human, dog, cat, fox, OK, mouse, those types of things. Then we've got our birds. They have feathers and wings. Most can fly, but there are some exceptions to that rule. They have beaks, they lay eggs, and they're warm-blooded. So we've got some examples like a wren and a swan. A fish has scales on its body, gills for breathing because they live underwater. They're cold-blooded, and so the examples we've got here are shark and tuna. These two groups, the reptiles and amphibians, are the ones that people most mix up. The amphibians have moist, slimy skin. They lay their eggs in water and they're cold-blooded. So things like frogs, um, newts, uh, toads, those types of things. But a reptile, people often think that snakes are going to be slimy and they're not. They have dry, scaly skin, lay eggs on land, they're cold-blooded. Things like your snake, your crocodile, okay, are reptiles, okay? So all of these organisms on this side, they all have a backbone. The invertebrates are a much, much larger group, okay? And in actual fact, they make up the majority of the, the animal species that are on planet Earth. So we've got some names of these are a bit complicated. If I start off, first of all, with the worms, because there are lots of different types of worms. <clears throat> so we have our flatworms. Pretty obvious they have a flat body, okay? Um, simple, soft bodies, things like tapeworms that you find in dogs and cats and other animals, okay? Um, and flukes, okay? There's something called a liver fluke that lives um, inside animals' bodies, normally in their intestines. We also have roundworms, and roundworms do not have any segments to them. Now, they've missed the roundworms out on this poster, so I'm just going to write that at the top there. And as I said, they don't have any segments. They are just like a round tube. This one is the common garden earthworm. OK, so an annelid has a segmented body. And all we mean by that is it's split up into different sections. So an earthworm and a leech would be our um, annelid. Then we've got um, echinoderms. 
star shaped bodies normally five kind of like um star shapes although there are some starfish that have more than this they are spiny they are often sea creatures um, and sea urchins are almost like a starfish that's actually curled its arms round and joined together. It is a completely different species, but if you look at the shape of a sea urchin, you can actually see the star-shaped pattern to it. Then we've got um, our mollusks. Now, mollusks are quite a large group. Some have a shell, okay, some don't. So things like snails, limpets, slugs belong to mollusks and they have this soft slimy foot that they move about on. Our cilentrates have soft bodies and stinging cells. The two massive groups that belong to this are your jellyfish and sea anemones. Um, and there's also a very simple organism called a hydra that belongs to this group. And also we've got our protozoa, single-celled organisms that are microscopic. So the kinds of things that you've come across before back in year 10, like amoeba and chlamydomonas, okay, that are single-celled. Now, the largest group of all the invertebrates is this group here, our arthropods. All arthropods have a hard external exoskeleton, we call it, and jointed limbs um, to allow them to move about. So when we split these up into their groups, okay, um, lots of people get these two mixed up. A spider is not an insect, okay? Spiders and insects are two separate groups of arthropods. So for example, arachnids is the scientific name for um, spiders. And the reason why they're different to insects, arachnids have two parts to their body and four pairs of legs or eight legs. OK, they don't have any antennae, um, so spiders and scorpions also belong to this group of arachnids. OK, um, so this is my very simple diagram of a spider, whereas insects, they have three parts to their body and they have three pairs of legs or six legs. OK, one pair normally of antennae as well. Bees ladybirds, butterflies, okay, beetles, all of those types of things, they belong to the insect group. So make sure you know the difference between your spiders and your insects. Crustaceans, mainly sea creatures, but we do have some that live on land. They have a chalky outer skeleton. They have many legs, um, two sets of antennae, um, and you can see that their body um, is split into many different sections here. So crabs, lobsters um, are the main ones that we tend to think about. And then our myriapod, that um, prefix means many, myria, and pod means feet, okay? So you can guess um, which types of organisms belong to this group, our centipedes and millipedes. And they are different to your annelids because they have legs, annelids do not. So they have body segments, but they have legs, okay? So that's an overview of classification. We then went on to look at some adaptations. So I've got our polar bear here, which was our QWC question that was on Moodle. And when you're talking about adaptations of the polar bear, they ask you in the um, exam questions normally to write what the feature is, the adaptation, and how it helps it to survive. So we have white fur. That's the feature, the adaptation. How does that help it to survive? Keyword, I'm expecting you to use key scientific terms because it camouflages the creature so it can sneak up on its prey easier. It is the top predator, so there's nothing that's going to eat that, okay? I know humans might sometimes hunt it, but there's nothing that's going to be hunting it normally. Another feature, very small head and these tiny, tiny little ears. It minimizes the surface area so less heat is lost. Minimize surface area so less heat is lost. Okay, we then have thick layer of fur. The word I would be expecting you to use to explain this would be that it acts as insulation. It traps air between each of the hairs. Compact body shape. This is um, all about having a small surface area to volume ratio. Now, 
that means that even though it's quite a large animal, it's kind of quite curvy, okay? It hasn't got a massive surface area. If you think of an elephant as a kind of opposite to it, an elephant has these huge ears, big surface area, okay, to help it lose more heat. A small surface area, sorry, I've missed out the word area, to volume ratio, um, minimizes the heat lost. Thick layer of fat, again, that key word that should be coming up to act as insulation, to keep the warmth in. Our camel is our next one that we look at. It lives in arid, very dry conditions. Very thin hair on top of its body because the sun is beating down on this all day. So we don't want to trap heat energy. The next one is we've got our futty hump. There is no water stored in this hump. That's what people's misconception is. This fatty hump acts for two reasons. First of all, it acts as insulation, preventing the main body of the camel overheating. So it's the opposite to our um, polar bear. Instead of keeping heat in, it acts to prevent heat getting to this main body of the camel. But also it is a food source because just look at its surroundings. There is not anything growing around there. So if there's not anything growing, there's not much food, it needs to have a food source, okay, um, to help it survive in these arid conditions. Nostrils which can close to prevent the sand blowing into their nose, very irritating. Two rows of eyelashes, again preventing those fine sand grains getting into their eyes. Sandy colouring. That key word again to help it camouflage against the desert. Little body fat, okay, on its underside because heat energy radiates up from here. If you've ever been on a beach holiday, you know how hot it can be on the sand to step on it sometimes. And the heat is going to hit its underbelly here. So it also has no hair on the underside of its belly here um, so that it doesn't get too hot. And these huge long legs, okay, which keep its body up away from the hot sand. Also, the long legs allow it to cover a greater distance in one stride. So as it walks forward, yeah, this leg, right, is going to cover a much greater distance than an animal with shorter little legs. Think of a little dash hound dog, okay, trotting along. It has to make many more steps to cover the same distance that a Great Dane does, okay? So adaptations of our um, camel. We also covered competition, okay? So there were other adaptations, so don't forget about them. This is just an overview. So there are two types of competition that you may be asked about. You need to know these definitions, okay? There's intra and inter. They sound very, very similar, okay? Intraspecific competition is competition between organisms of the same species. So our two male hippos here are fighting, they're not kissing. And our two, I think these are oryx, okay, um, that are fighting here with their antlers, they would be males. Interspecific competition is competition between two different species. So we've got a lioness here and hyenas, and she's obviously just killed something. The hyenas want a fair share of it, but she's not sharing with them, okay? So competition can happen between members of the same species or between different species. The kinds of things that they might compete for, so if we start looking at these plants, this oak tree and primroses, so primroses sometimes grow underneath the oak tree, the primroses will come out first um, before the leaves on the oak tree. There's a good reason for that, because once the oak tree gets all its leaves come out, it will shade the primroses underneath here. So primroses are one of the earliest spring flowers that we see. Um, they flower early to avoid competition for light. Um, and then once they have died back, then our oak tree um, will start to uh, produce its leaves so that it can maximise its rate of photosynthesis. So think about some of the resources that both animals and plants um, need and that they might compete for like space, nutrients, water, um, light um, with our plants, uh, competing for a mate, for food, for water, um, for a habitat with our animals. So what do we mean by biodiversity then? Um, you've seen this photograph before, it's one of my favourite habitats here. Biodiversity, if we break that word up, okay, Diversity means lots of differences. I did an assembly on this last year 
and our biodiversity is not just the different types, the variety of species, but it's also the numbers within those species in an area. So if you've got a very biodiverse habitat, you've got lots of different types of species, but huge numbers of those different types of species, which we can see here, all the anemones and the coral and all the different types of fish that are living in this marine environment. It's really important that we protect species as a change in population of just one can have a massive impact on the other organisms in a food web in a particular habitat. So how can we protect them? Well, we can make sure that they're not overhunted. We can make sure that, they're, um, that we don't introduce any new species into that environment that may compete with those. We can make sure we don't pollute that environment and damage it, um, that the uh, environmental uh, factors don't change in that area. So things like um, global warming is obviously having a massive impact with temperature change in the oceans. Um, we can take organisms into breeding programs, which we do do in zoos and also in things like seed banks. However, if we do take organisms into breeding programs, sometimes some animals, um, when they're in captivity, uh, don't breed due to stress. Okay, so it's really important that we are saving these species for our next generation and to ensure that it doesn't impact on the changing food chains. Quadrats comes up next. Now this is where we can start to look at measuring um, population numbers and also distribution. Now there's a difference between how we use the quadrat. There are two ways that we can use them. We can either use them in this method up the top here. Um, this would be uh, where we place a quadrat in a random place to estimate total population of something in an area. So for example, if I wanted you to find out roughly how many daisies or dandelions were on the school field, you go out, you throw these quadrats randomly, you take multiple samples, you'd add up all the numbers, okay, and then you'd find out the average. However, if I wanted to find out how the distribution of the daisies and the dandelions changed from one set of goalposts to the other across the field, then I set up what we call a transect. And a transect is an imaginary line that we can see in this picture here. So it's normally a tape measure. And along the tape measure, we would place our quadrat at regular intervals. So instead of it being placed randomly, we would place it, say, at zero and then at two metres and four and six and so on. If we want to make our, our data a little bit more um, accurate, we might, OK, place them every metre. OK, so we would build up a better pattern, a picture of how the um, species are distributed across an area. I'm going into a woodland with the bluebell task that you did for me in class, OK, um, or uh, going across a football pitch. And just to show you that this doesn't just happen on land, we can even use quadrats underwater, this diver here. And also quadrats can be done with very small organisms. They tend to be done with immobile organisms, in other words, ones that don't move. So this um, biologist is obviously studying the corals um, on the seabed here. But it can be done with even things like uh, uh, bacteria underneath a microscope, okay? Um, it can be done with uh, looking at number of red blood cells in a, um, a sample. So we have, they only work for immobile, slow moving. The more data you collect, the more reproducible your results. So the more samples, the better. Uh, quadrats, when you're looking at population, should be placed randomly and that's to avoid bias so you don't go out and go oh there's a good patch of um, daisies i'm going to put it on there if you don't know the exact size of your field you can estimate the percentage cover by seeing what percentage of each quadrat contains the organisms and calculating the mean you can conduct a transect to investigate distribution of a species in a particular habitat so they're the top tips for quadrats Capture, recapture to estimate population size. You will never have to remember this equation off by heart. They will always give that to you in the exam. Um, so just make sure you read the question carefully. 
take the figures from the question and you put them into your equation, always show you're working. So you would have the number in the first sample times the number in the second sample, and then you divide it by the number in the second sample that had been previously marked. So they will give that information to you. Make sure you've got the numbers in the right order. The kinds of questions they might ask you about capture recapture is you have to assume that when you are doing capture recapture data that, that one, there is no death amongst the species, uh, two, that there's no immigration or emigration. That counts as one mark, so don't think you're going to get a mark for both of them. And three, that the marking technique does not affect their chances of survival. So I have told you in my um, lessons about uh, the grasshoppers that we were told to mark with nail polish on the back of their abdomen. And uh, obviously the teacher had not realised that uh, grasshoppers breathe through a tiny hole on their abdomen called a spiracle. And by painting a dab of nail polish onto them, we managed to kill off a population of grasshoppers that summer in our field trip. OK, um, the same with if you put any colour on an organism that's going to make it easier to spot by predators. That's obviously going to mean that they're going to be easier to be picked off and eaten and it will affect their chances of survival. OK, so if they ask you for a suggestion for how you should mark them, mark them on the underside of the organism, if it's something like a snail, OK, or use a UV marker so that uh, that mark doesn't show up in normal light, but uh, you can use a UV torch to to see them. And then the last part of this B1 point um, uh, 2.1 section is all about biological control. So there's some key words that you need to know about. You need to know about um, uh, biological control species, okay? So for example, ladybirds are introduced into populations so that they can eat the green fly because they're its natural predator, okay? However, if you introduce a species like the Hawaiian cane toad, our little friend here, who likes to eat, okay, um, uh, cane beetles. So cane beetles have become a bit of a pest. They've been eating the cane crop in Australia. So the Australians thought it would be a good idea to enjoy, uh, introduce this Hawaiian cane toad. Obviously, it's not native to Australia. So that's a word that people um, sometimes forget in the exam. Uh, native means that it doesn't normally exist in Australia. It lives in, uh, in Hawaii, this particular um, toad normally, um, but it loves to eat cane beetles, okay? So they thought they could introduce it, it would eat the cane beetles, and then the cane beetles population would drop and it would mean that the sugar cane wasn't affected so the farmers could get a bigger crop. However, these cane toads, obviously the environment they were introduced into um, was perfect for them to reproduce rapidly because they didn't have any of their own um, natural predators to eat them. They're poisonous. They've caused a reduction in the population of the native toads that live in Australia. Um, and we call them an alien species because they are not normally found in that area. So they're actually causing more damage than the pest they were supposed to control. So make sure you know those keywords. So the second booklet that you went on to, this was a super short booklet, okay? We were literally, we were looking at the structure of chromosomes and a little bit of DNA, which we then have gone on further to, to look at in the third booklet. Mitosis, meiosis, comparing them, that is your QWC question that's on Moodle. And looking at things like stem cells and what happens when cells start to divide um, out of control, okay? So, first of all, you've got this picture in your booklet for B2.2. We've got our cell. Any cell in your body that has a nucleus will have DNA in it. It will have chromosomes. So a human cell has 46 chromosomes if it's a body cell. If we unravel these chromosomes, we get this DNA structure, this um, uh, double helix that we've talked about in the most recent unit, okay? What's really important about this DNA is that it's in units called genes, and these genes are found as like little strands or bands on the chromosomes. So the genes are always on chromosomes, and your chromosomes come in pairs in your body cells because all of your chromosomes have come from your parents. 23 from dad's sperm, 
23 for mum's egg and when they join together at fertilisation they make the full set, the full complement of 46 chromosomes. So of these 46 chromosomes you've got um, one of each pair, one comes from mum and one comes from dad. So when we're talking about numbers of chromosomes, there are two words that we use, haploid and diploid. And hopefully you got to play a game of haploid, diploid, bingo in your lessons. Your body cells, what we call a somatic cell, so that's what that word means, all have exactly the same kind and number of chromosomes and we call that the diploid number. Some people call it the double number, but the word I want you to use in the exam is diploid, please. So in a human, there are 46 chromosomes and we can see them arranged here. This is called a karyotype, this kind of like little map of somebody's chromosomes. That means that a human skin cell has 46 chromosomes in the nucleus. So does a human heart cell. So does a human muscle cell. OK, and a human sperm, though, is a gamete. So that's the technical word for a sex cell. It only has 23 chromosomes. Our fruit fly, though, here has eight chromosomes, two there, four, six in the middle, and then these last two on the end, eight. So human eggs have 23, sorry, apologies. So a fruit fly skin cell would have eight chromosomes, so would a heart cell, so would its muscle cell, but a fruit fly sperm would have half, 44 chromosomes, and its egg would have half, four. So these two numbers here, these are called the haploid number. Think of hat like half. So this is the haploid number. So doesn't matter what the organism is that they tell you. If they tell you it's a skin cell and it's got um, 48 chromosomes, then you know that a, um, a sperm from that same organism would have half of 48. It would have 24. Same with an egg to make sure you know the difference between the haploid and diploid number. Now, the two types of cell division. Mitosis is the type of cell division for growth and repair. Um, we're only showing you two chromosomes here just to make it easy. So to begin with, the original cell is called the parent cell, okay? Sometimes they call it the mother cell, okay? Right, um, but parent cell is fine. The parent cell, the chromosomes, first of all, make a copy. So you can see that they become like X-shaped structures. This is when the DNA replicates. They line themselves up in the middle of the cell and you get this kind of funny, like spider's web structure created. It's called a spindle. The chromosomes attach to the spindle and they get pulled apart, stretched, so that two chromosomes go to this end, two chromosomes go to the other end. The cell then splits itself and divides to make two new daughter cells. These daughter cells are genetically identical to the original parent cell. In other words, they have the same number of chromosomes, so they've got two, and they've got the same amount and type of DNA. So mitosis, okay, creates daughter cells that are genetically identical to the original parent cell. This type of division is happening right now in your skin cells, in your hair, in your nails, um, everywhere in your body where it's making all the cells exactly the same. So the cell replicates the copies of the DNA and most of the time the DNA is copied exactly. However, if the DNA makes a mistake when it copies it, we call that a mutation. So sometimes you get mutations may happen in chromosomes that don't code for anything and are not important. And most of those mutations are harmless. However, if a mutation occurs in a really important part of the chromosome, um, then it can cause issues. So it can lead to inherited disorders. Um, it can lead to skin cancer. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about mutations later. So each daughter cell genetically identical to the parent cell um, and is used for growth and repair. OK, so if they ask you its function, that's what it's for. Meiosis, however, though, is the opposite. It makes gametes. In other words, it makes sex cells. So meiosis is going to be happening in the sex organs in the testes of males, in the ovaries of females.
It produces four gamete cells as opposed to two daughter cells. The daughter cells, instead of being diploid like they are in mitosis, in other words, they would have the same number of chromosomes as the original parent cell, they're haploid. So in a human, they would have 23 chromosomes. In mitosis, 23 pairs, yeah? In other words, 46 chromosomes. The gametes are also genetically different to each other. They've had mixed up DNA where the chromosomes, when they line up on the spindle to um, be pulled apart, they line up in pairs and they might swap little bits of their um, sections of their, I suppose it looks like arms and legs, okay? So if this bit mixes up and swaps with this bit, it mixes the DNA. That's really important for variation. It ensures that every single sperm and egg is slightly different. So the gametes are different due to this crossing over of genetic material. It is a two-stage process, whereas mitosis just divides once, makes copy, divides once. Meiosis makes a copy and divides twice so that you get this half number. And it only happens in the reproductive organs, whereas mitosis happens everywhere. This is what happens when cells start to divide out of control to form cancer. So here's our first cell. It might have a small change or alteration in the DNA when it was copied. That's the first mutation. When that cell then starts to divide, it might have a second or third um, mutation. And then they start to grow these cells completely out of control and form a tumour. That tumour can be what we call benign or malignant. A benign tumour is not harmful, okay? It's not going to cause cancer. However, it depends where it is. If it's growing in your brain, it might not be harmful, but it's going to be pressing on other organs and blood vessels, and that's when benign tumours can cause a problem if they grow um, quite large. A malignant tumour tumor is one that can spread to other parts of the body and um, really needs to be dealt with as soon as it appears so that it doesn't have a chance to spread. So DNA controls all the activities, including cell division, but some cells lose their ability to control their rate of cell division because they've been mutated. When cells start to divide out of control, that's when we develop tumours. Okay, therefore masses of cells called tumours. So there's an information sheet here on stem cells. We did quite a lot of work on this because you were back in school by this point. A stem cell is an unspecialized, undifferentiated type of cell that has the ability to turn into any other type of cell. There are three places that generally we get stem cells from. You can get them from bone marrow, um, but this is normally quite painful to do, to collect bone marrow um, for stem cells from other people. Um, the adult bone marrow stem cells as well don't have the ability to turn into as many different types of cells that we would like. Okay. Um, the second place we get our stem cells from is the most controversial. It's from human embryos that have been left over from IVF treatment. So when somebody has had IVF, they might make multiple embryos that are normally stored and frozen. If the couple get pregnant and they've got their family and they've already got um, enough children that they um, would like, then those unused um, human embryos, the couple have to consent to either um, allow them to defrost and they perish naturally, or they can donate those unused human embryos for research for stem cell technology, okay? Uh, the third place, which is the most um, likely place for the future for um, a source of adult stem cells or for stem cells, is um, from human embryos umbilical cord. So every baby that's born in the UK um, has an umbilical cord that attaches them to mum. And within the umbilical cord, there are these embryonic stem cells. So they've not come from unused um, human embryos. So there aren't any ethical issues or concerns with them. And these embryos, okay, could have the potential to be used without upsetting religious groups or people who um, believe in what we call pro-life, okay, uh, that 
uh, the moment a sperm sometimes is released or even the moment the sperm fertilizes the egg, they believe that that has the potential for human life, which it does. But technically, human life does not start until that fertilized egg or sper and sperm cell bury itself into the uterus lining to get enough blood containing oxygen to be able to grow into an embryo. So certain religious groups and pro-life groups would be happier using stem cells from umbilical cords because there's no issues of consent of the embryo um, uh, to give its consent to be used for research um, in stem cells. There's no potential death of the embryo. Um, so it is much more um, likely to, to keep everybody happy, okay? So stem cells, potential uses, we can use these potential stem cells to turn into any other type of cell that could be used to cure certain conditions. So into brain cells for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, into pancreatic cells for treating diabetes, into nerve cells for treating MS, into um, cells of the spinal cord for treating paralysis in people who've been paralyzed in spinal cord injuries, okay? In rheumatoid arthritis as well. Um, so there's lots of different ways we can use them. The final bit that I'm gonna go over, okay, just goes up to here, up to genetic profiling. So we've got structure of DNA um, and base pairing. The bases themselves, which this is higher tier just for the names. The letters are for foundation. The role of the triplet code in protein synthesis is higher tier and genetic profiling. So here's our double helix. Make sure that you could identify and label up the different parts on the DNA. So it's a chain of alternating sugar and phosphate going down the backbone, two chains. And across the middle are the names of the four bases. So they're adenine and thymine, cytosine and guanine. And they always pair up in this pattern, A with T and C with G. The order of these bases is really important because the triplet code, basically every three, determines one amino acid. And when our amino acids are joined together in a certain order, that will determine our protein. So we call the group of three the triplet code, but you might also see it written as a codon, okay, in some books and on websites. Okay, so make sure that you could label those up. One part that um, they can often ask you about is if you've got your um, five carbon sugar, so that's my five carbon sugar, next to it will be a phosphate, okay, that's attached to it. And obviously this goes all the way down a sugar and a phosphate, so on. The sugar, the phosphate, and the base together is called a nucleotide, okay? So that little section is a nucleotide, and they all fit